Hey guys, welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, and this is a recap, a giant recap of trial days 22 to 30 in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. You know what? Forget the red solo cups, grab an entire pitcher, pour yourselves a drink, and let's recap. We've got a lot to go over. So thanks for holding down the fort, you guys. I have been away. I've been traveling internationally. And no, I did not have a good enough Wi-Fi internet setup in order to watch or record the trials on a daily basis. So after struggling with it for the first few days, I decided, you know what, let me just give it to God and take my break, take a little rest, and I'll catch up on the on the tail end of this of this trip. So that's what I did. Unfortunately, I did come back and I was under the weather for quite a number of days. I'm still trying to get over it now, but because we are finally at the end of this trial, we have reached trial day 30, I believe we're on right now. And the defense has rested its case. All of a sudden, just like that, this trial is now over. The testimony portion of it, anyway, is now over. The defense has pres has been presenting its case for the past couple of days. Today is Monday, June 24th. The defense has only presented its case for a couple of days. And um, before the afternoon break, it closed its case. And there is no Commonwealth rebuttal case. So the judge dismissed the jury for the day. And tomorrow we will begin our closing statements. Apparently, both sides are only being given one hour of time uh, to make their closing statements, which to be honest with you, I thought uh, that they're both going to be limited I was afraid that, you know, if there was no time limit on the closing statements that that the Commonwealth would just drone on and on and on. Similar to what we saw during this trial, weeks and weeks and weeks on end of testimony being presented, similar to what they did in their opening statements as well, when they just droned on and on and confused everybody and didn't even clarify what theory of their case was, frankly. Now, let me just reiterate that I came into this case unaware of all of the drama surrounding the case. Um, I realized that there were two distinct camps that were very much either in favor of a conviction or very much against this trial and conviction for Karen Reed. And I didn't get into any of that. I didn't watch any of the pretrial hearings. I didn't follow this case at all. Um, if you'll recall, the first day of the trial, I showed up on here and was like, surprise, we're covering this. And I really did make that decision, a split decision. So I've been watching this case, same manner that a jury would be watching it. I still haven't exposed myself to all the extra information that's out there. And I do know that it's out there. I do see comments and, you know, comments on my videos are telling me information that I'm like, I've never heard this before and it hasn't been presented in trial. So I know that there's a world of other things going on. There's another um, investigation or multiple investigations, a federal investigation, but my coverage of this case has been solely the uh, trial that is going on in Canton, um, exclusion of everything else. So let's get right into this because I don't want this to go on and on and on because it can. I am covering many days worth of testimony. I'm not going to go through tons of nitty gritty for every witness. This is, I will just try to succinctly summarize um, the takeaway from their testimony. So we finished 
uh, with Trooper Buchanick's testimony being completed. A large part of his testimony and cross actually com concerning concerning the, the Sally Port video that we saw that was flipped when the Commonwealth introduced it. The Commonwealth introducing the video like that was entirely misleading because it was mirrored. The defense counsel admitted a non-mirrored true-to-life rendition of the video so that the driver's side and the passenger side of the defendant's SUV appear where we would expect it to appear. And it was incredibly helpful for us to see it in the correct perspective. We heard from Nicholas Barros, who is a Dighton police sergeant. Dighton is the name of the community where Karen Reed's parents lived. And she went to her parents' home morning that Saturday morning after finding Adi at 34 Fairview. She ended up at her parents' home, and that was before she went to the hospital on the Section 12 hold. Sergeant Barrows uh, was the officer who met Proctor, Michael Proctor, at Karen Reed's parents' house. He facilitated the towing of the vehicle back to Canton, and that was the first interaction of law enforcement with the vehicle. He testified, and I thought that this was very pivotal and critical testimony. He testified that he saw the damage to the right rear taillight and described it, get this, as a crack with a small piece missing, but not completely damaged. He said there was also a dent on the rear, qu rear quarter of the vehicle. There was no cross-examination. The next witness who was called was Trooper Michael Proctor. And this was the lead investigator or the case officer for the case. During his direct examination, he described his relationship with the other witnesses like the Alberts, his sister, Courtney Proctor, their incredibly close relationship. He said they talk to each other five, six times per day. I was like, um, that's a lot. Do you guys work? <laughs> Well, that's questionable because we saw just how um, deficient and inaccurate and how terrible his investigation was. His testimony about the taillight was that it was damaged to a much greater degree than the Dighton police officer, Barros, testified. So there's definitely inconsistencies there. We saw the ring camera footage from John O'Keefe's house again when the defendant's car backed out of the garage and backed into John's car in the driveway. Now, the Dighton police officer's account of the taillight makes logical sense when taking that video into account. And testimony also matched what Carrie Roberts testified seeing. They brought the actual taillight pieces out into court, and Proctor talked about his multiple visits to 34 Fairview to see the taillight pieces that revealed themselves in the melting snow over several days and weeks. They discussed why there was no ring camera footage from when Karen Reed returned to John's house after being at 34 Fairview. It had seemed like someone was going to testify that it had been deleted, but the judge wouldn't allow it to come in. The defense objected multiple times regarding that line of testimony, and the judge she was quick to sustain them. So we didn't get to hear testimony about where that video ended up. Now, surprisingly, the Commonwealth introduced a series of what Proctor called unfortunate text messages. Now, this was undoubtedly the most uncomfortable, vile, dehumanizing and disgusting display of communications from what we were told was a professional law enforcement officer that I've ever witnessed. And I've seen quite a lot in my career litigating all kinds of civil matters. To summarize, Proctor texted with different people calling the defendant, Karen Reed, the most disgusting derogatory names, making fun of her serious medical conditions, wishing that she would delete herself, joking that he hadn't found her nude pictures yet on her phone, calling her hot but with a flat butt and a weird accent. Proctor's cross-examination defense counsel immediately brought these messages back up and asked whether Proctor was objectively investigating the case or whether he was just objectifying the defendant. All the witness could do was repeat that these were, quote, unfortunate and unprofessional text messages. He was asked whether when he texted about the defendant leaking poo from a balloon 
if he knew that she had a colostomy or 10 surgeries in the last year and a half for intestinal issue, issues. So the defense was able to introduce some of her medical condition to the jury without needing her to actually testify about them. Not only that, but those conditions might possibly explain some of her behaviors. Like we think back to needing the privacy of a separate room and bathroom when they traveled to Aruba so that she wouldn't need to be sharing it with two teenagers or teens, kids, preteens. I don't remember how old John's niece and nephew were at the time. But, you know, somebody with uh, some serious intestinal issues would need probably a lot of privacy and the benefit of having a private bedroom and bathroom to use. Um, even needing to go home and not go into 34 Fairview that night. So Proctor not only spoke derogatory about Karen Reed, but also about the medical examiner who happened to be a woman. He called her crazy and a whack job because she didn't agree with his determination that a homicide had occurred. What I don't understand is why exactly Proctor seemed to immediately hate Karen Reed, a woman he didn't know from before the incident. He set his sights on her from the earliest moment and he never wavered in his absolute contempt for her. He only looked to her as the perpetrator of John's death. He didn't look to anybody else. We learned that Proctor talked to everybody about the case right from the start, his sister, his high school friends, and of course, the coworkers and higher ups. One of the high school friends texted that the homeowner where John was found was going to be in trouble. And Proctor replied, quote, nope, he's a Boston police officer too, close quote. And he later texted on the evening of January 29th, that the homeowner did nothing wrong. By that point, Proctor had only spoken with Jen McKay, Brian Albert, Carrie Roberts, some hospital staff, the defendant, and Canton PD. So the evening of the incident, he had already decided that Karen Reed was guilty, had done it, and that Brian Albert had done nothing wrong, which goes to the defense's theory that they pinned this on her and failed to investigate anybody else. Proctor was asked about his relationship with Kevin Albert, who is a Canton police officer, and the communications that they had with each other, despite Canton police being recused off of the case because of the conflict caused by Kevin Albert. So he said that Kevin um, arranged witnesses and witness statements. And we learned that they had been working a different case together and had gone out drinking. Apparently, they drank a whole lot because text messages between the two the next morning revealed that Kevin Albert had a serious hangover and had lost his service gun and badge in Proctor's car. It's just wild. The implication of that is, is astounding. Next, they talk about the Sally Port videos. Proctor testified that he saw the video, but it wasn't inverted like what the Commonwealth originally showed us. The only thing inverted on the video that he saw was the timestamp, which also was a different color. It was yellow, not blue, like the timestamps that we saw. So there's a question about what video did he watch? On cross-examination, we heard about how Trooper DeChico's oops, mentioned there being ring footage from 1241 showing taillights with a question about Karen Reed returning home. But that ring video doesn't seem to exist anywhere. Proctor said he didn't delete the video and that the video doesn't exist from the 29th. So when asked about this, Proctor said that DeChico's notes don't show the date for the 1241 a.m. reference. So DeChico would have to answer any additional questions about that. So by this, we know that somebody, somebody in law enforcement saw the video of Karen returning home to John O'Keefe's house that uh, morning. But now, after being in the possession of Proctor, that video somehow disappeared. The video that probably would have shown the state of the tail on Karen Reed's SUV. The next witness that took the stand was Trooper Brian Tully who directed the CERT team and who told them what they were looking for at 34 Fairview that next morning. On cross, he was grilled about why he didn't make any attempt to obtain a search warrant for the house 
at 34 Fairview. There were so many reasons that he could have tied John to being in the home, yet he didn't have a jacket on. Perhaps the jacket was in the house. John had been invited to the house by people who were in the house. John had been out partying with the people that were in the house. There was a broken drinking glass outside. Perhaps that glass came from inside the house. Yet he didn't think it necessary to even attempt to get a search warrant for the home. Next, there were science witnesses who testified about, I don't know, sciencey things like DNA. Remember that one sole hair that was found on the car? It was cut and sent for testing. It's likely that it came from John O'Keefe. Okay, so it came from John O'Keefe. John O'Keefe probably drove that car a lot. John O'Keefe's DNA should be on the car, you would think, as somebody who's in a relationship with the owner of the vehicle. The DNA taken from his clothing was tested. All of the DNA came from John O'Keefe, but there were also contributors Unfortunately, there was not enough DNA from the other contributors to test who it belonged to, so we don't know. The DNA on the taillight came back as John O'Keefe's, but the testing excluded Trooper Proctor's and Buchanan's DNA. We finally saw some cell phone data testimony. We got cell tower data that showed where Karen Reed's car was and how it traveled the night of the 28th into the 29th. We saw that it pinged near John O'Keefe's house by 12.39 p.m. And then the travel route of the phone the next morning as Karen traveled around looking for John. We learned that between 12.33 and 6.03 a.m. On, on January 29th, the defendant called John 53 times. That's a lot of calls. That's a huge amount of calls. And that gives some clarity as to why she was panicked by the time she presumably woke up close to five o'clock in the morning and she panicked, started calling. We got two expert witnesses who discussed Jen McCabe's cell phone searches. Remember how it appeared to search Google for how long to die in the cold in the early morning hours of January 29th? Jen swore that the only thing she searched was a basketball team for her daughter, but she admitted searching how long to die in cold the following morning after 6 a.m while she was with Karen, just after finding John in the snow. The cell phone experts concluded that the search at 2 a.m. was for basketball and basketball only. Now, my understanding is something about the tab not being closed out and Jen used the same open tab for, my understanding is that the tab was not closed out and Jen used the same open tab for the 623 and 624 searches. In other words, the two o'clock references the time of the tab, not the time of the search. It's a little confusing. And after multiple days of testimony and I think four different experts, um, I just decided to cancel, cancel it out entirely. Cancel out all the experts regarding Jen McCabe's email, uh, Google searches, because you know what? The Google searches don't tell us what happened to John O'Keefe. They don't tell us how he ended up in the snow on 34 Fairview's front lawn. And they don't tell us what happened. They don't tell us whether there was a physical altercation or if he was hit by a vehicle. So I've personally decided, and I have a feeling that maybe some of the members of the jury as well. Um, they may also make that same decision just to cancel, cancel it out because we had multiple days of witnesses talking at length, um, about these Google searches and the information that they both give, they contradict each other. And, you know, what do you do in that instance? Some of the expert witnesses were better than other expert witnesses, but does that um, negate the information they're providing? I don't know. This is what we talk about when we talk about the battle of the experts in litigation. At some point, the jury has to either believe one set of experts over the other or dismiss uh, dismiss it entirely and rely on other stuff. Thankfully here, I don't feel quite so bad 
uh, dismissing it just because, like I said, it doesn't point us to what actually happened here. It doesn't, it doesn't needle in terms of the accounts agreed, and it doesn't let us or inform us any further about what happened to John O'Keefe. We got into the Commonwealth's accident reconstruction expert who plotted out his map, if you will, of where the victim's final landing spot was, as well as key pieces of evidence. All his information, however, came from other people or reports. None of it was firsthand knowledge. And the data he relied on from the car is not dated. The car data is measured in terms of key cycles, which is every time the car is powered on, not necessarily started, but you know, the electronics turned on. The Commonwealth attempted to match up the key cycles from Karen's car to the account for the point when they claimed John O'Keefe was hit. And the witness opined that the log data from the car was consistent with a collision between the car and a pedestrian based on a half mile deceleration in reverse and a slight turn of the steering wheel. That's basically all he based his um, his findings on. Yeah. This witness, who's this Trooper Paul, the Commonwealth accident reconstructionist, he testified about how he believes a collision happened where Karen Reed hit John O'Keefe. He said at 12.45 a.m. outside 34 Fairview, Karen Reed reversed he said she was in front of 34 Fairview and she reversed going up to 24 miles per hour for 62 feet. He said the right rear of the vehicle hit John and he was thrown forward and to the left of the front lawn and that the car continued traveling in reverse before leaving the area. The witness ruled out any mechanical roadway or environmental factors that contributed to the collision. The cross-examination of this witness was brutal. The witness testified that his highest level of education is an associate's degree in administration of justice. But because the witness testified at length about kinematics in his direct examination, he was asked what it was, and he defined it as the science of motion. And he kind of had to be helped in his definition of it, and he agreed that it was a subset of physics. He said, while he doesn't have a degree or certificate in the field, he's taken 120 hours worth of classes that taught him enough to be the Commonwealth's expert. Now, when you see the defense expert, uh, expert accident reconstructionists, there will be two of them, you will see how vastly different they are in terms of their education levels, their experience, um, and just their credibility. And mind you, the defense experts were not hired by the defense. These are experts that came in from federal investigation. The jury doesn't know this, but we know this. So the defense experts that were brought in we're not even biased for the defense because they're not being paid. They don't answer to. And in fact, they never even met with the defense team prior to giving their testimony. So the witness was challenged about his conclusion that the evidence was consistent with a vehicle, vehicle pedestrian collision. A witness said that his conclusion was not definitive. He was challenged about uh, the area of impact based on the location that the debris was found, as well as where he was told John's body was found. Defense counsel showed him pictures of the debris that were located even further away from where the witness originally thought the furthest debris was found. And he was asked whether that new information changes his analysis of where the area of impact was. Now, instead of saying that there was one specific point of impact where the SUV hit John's body, the witness testified that the area of impact is a, quote, linear field. So somewhere along an imaginary line along the roadway, he was hit and projected to a final resting spot about 30 feet away. Away from what? Who knows? This imaginary linear field. 
The witness couldn't give more definite measurements, but he did say there was no evidence that John walked or flew the entire or any portion of those 30 feet. Witness said that before he began reviewing the case, the car or the evidence, he was basically told the conclusion from Proctor that there had been a vehicle pedestrian crash. And then he was told to investigate and reconstruct the vehicle pedestrian crash, basically told to confirm the conclusion that was already reached. Remember the morning of the incident. He said he saw some scratches on the vehicle that didn't really match up to being from a pedestrian accident. And then they went back and forth for quite a while about the glass cup and if in the witness's opinion would change if he knew that the glass found on the tailgate was not from the cup. Now, I couldn't tell if he was being dense, elusive, or something else, but he finally landed on saying that the glass was the glass and it didn't matter where the glass came from. I was just like, what? I think he was done. He was over testifying by that point. Similarly, he said that if he was told that John's body was found in a different location than where he based his opinion on, whether his opinion would change, he said no. All of this to say that the witness relied on information that was incorrect or in controversy. Lieutenant Tudley's report that listed the wrong number of taillight pieces. All of this to say that the witness relied on information that was incorrect or in controversy. Lieutenant Tully's report that listed the wrong number of taillight pieces, Lieutenant Gallagher's best guess of where John's body was found because he never saw John personally. The witness admitted that if the information given to him was inaccurate, his conclusions would be wrong too. Next day, they had a day of voir dire for the defense witnesses, the defense experts specifically. There was forth about whether or not these witnesses were able to testify because uh, they hadn't been disclosed or their information hadn't been fully disclosed to the Commonwealth in a timely manner. Um, however, at the end of the day, they were allowed to testify. There may have been some restraints on um the scope of the testimony, but they were allowed to testify. So I will get into the defense expert witnesses, but not before we finish out uh, a quick recap of the Commonwealth's expert witnesses and see how they closed out their case in chief. We had their medical examiner testify that there were no significant injuries to John's mid and lower body other than those related to CPR. She opined that John's cause of death was from blunt force trauma and hypothermia. On cross-examination, she admitted that his facial injuries could have been caused by a punch, that the scratches around the lacerations on his head could have been caused by being dragged, she admitted that the irregular laceration could have been caused by falling on the laceration on the back of his head could have been caused by falling on concrete or frozen ground or being hit by a blunt force like a baseball bat or a barbell. She admitted that the lacerations on John's arm was not road rash, but that the discrete linear abrasions could have been caused by an animal claw. She also admitted that the injuries to his head could have been caused by multiple impacts instead of a single impact. She said John had a minor abrasion to John's, uh, to his outer knee. And with that, the Commonwealth ended its case. So the defense counsel, of course, got up, made its motion for a directed verdict that no reasonable jury could come to a unanimous verdict for the Commonwealth. They argued that there was no competent evidence that Karen Reed's car struck John O'Keefe, which is a required element uh, in the three counts against her. Trooper Paul, the accident reconstructionist, provided the theory that John O'Keefe's arm was struck he spun around and was projected approximately 30 feet, falling to the ground in the snow uh, in the front yard at 34 Fairview. 
The defense argued that there's no evidence that the arm was broken or sprained and no injuries to the body consistent with being hit by a 7,000 pound car. The medical exam examiner for the Commonwealth opined that John O'Keefe's injuries are consistent with a physical altercation and that they are not consistent with a classic pedestrian, um, pedestrian vehicle injuries. And the medical examiner herself did not believe that there was a homicide. The Commonwealth got up and argued that Trooper Paul's testimony is not what makes or breaks the case. He reminded the court of all the physical as physical evidence, the shoe, the glass, the microscopic pieces of taillight that were embedded in John's clothing, not John's skin, the taillight that was puzzle pieced back together, the magic single hair found on the car, the evidence showing the state of Karen and John's relationship. Now, unsurprisingly, the judge denied the defense's motion that could have been, you know, anybody's guess. These motions are extremely rare um, to be granted. So I was not surprised at all that the judge decided to go ahead and hand the case to the jury, the ultimate trier of facts to determine uh, whether or not the Commonwealth had in fact um, proved its case in chief. So the defense at that point proceeded with its case in rebuttal. And it was good. The first defense witness was Brian Wofford, the snowplow driver who plowed Fairview the night of the incident. His assigned truck was called the Franken truck because of all the aftermar aftermarket parts put on it. The lighting on the plow he described as driving with spotlights so he was able to see a far distance from where he sat in Franken truck. At 2.45 a.m. when he was passing by 34 Fairview, he had full view of the front yard. His head was on swivel to ensure no pedestrians or animals or cars backing out of the driveways were in danger of being struck by his plow. So at 2.45, the first time he passed 34 Fairview, he saw nothing out of the ordinary on the front lawn. When he got to the end of Fairview, he turned the plow around and headed back down Fairview again. Again, he saw nothing in the yard. He continued with his route and approached Fairview Road again around 3.15, 3.30. This time when he passed 34 Fairview, he testified that he saw a Ford Edge on the side of the road in front of the Alberts' house by the flagpole, which he thought was unusual because he said the Alberts never had cars that they parked out front. He said he had to go around the Ford Edge to avoid hitting it, which was against policy, but he did it anyway as a courtesy to the Alberts. He went to the end of Fairview and turned around and again on the way back, he saw the Edge uh, parked in the same spot. He said he, said he couldn't see anything beyond the Edge because it blocked the view. The last time he attempted to plow Fairview, he was blocked by first responders. He said he was never approached by any police investigators until 2023, and those people were Proctor and Buchanan. On cross, we learned that the witness, who is also called Lucky Lochran, is colorblind, although he can tell light colors from dark colors. Now, he testified that the car, the Ford Edge that he saw, was light colored, which I believe the Ford Edge owned by the Alberts um, I believe it was a dark colored Ford Edge. So that just calls his testimony a little bit into question. He said that he did not see John's body at all that night. He only testified to seeing the Ford Edge by the flagpole. He was asked about multiple facts from Proctor's 2023 report and denied the accuracy of them. If you've been watching this trial, you'll realize that this was a continuing issue. Proctor included details in most of his reports that were just not true or accurate in any way. For example, uh, the witness clocked into work at 2.30, whereas Proctor's report says he was plowing at midnight and 2 a.m., which is obviously earlier than the time that he even showed up to work. Purely inaccurate. The witness was asked about hitting a basketball hoop on a different street that night. 
The witness said that he underestimated the distance and the size of the plow, but that he called his boss to let him know about the event. He testified that he never saw a black Lexus in front of 34 Fairview that night at all. The next witness was Dr. Marie Russell, the retired emergency room doctor who is highly experienced in the field of animal bites and scratches. She reviewed hospital pictures, autopsy pictures, and reports, grand jury testimony of the autopsy pathologist, um, and city of Canton animal bite reports. She opined that the injuries to John O'Keefe's arm were caused by an animal, possibly a large dog, because of the patterns that she saw in the injuries. She said some of the patterns could have been made by teeth or claw marks. The next witness was Richard Green, a cell phone expert. He put John O'Keefe arriving at 34 Fairview at 1224, I believe. He found that Jen McCabe searched Hoslong to Dying Cold at or before 227 a.m. and that the tab history in which it was searched was deleted. He testified that he knows of no internal cell phone mechanisms that would auto-delete Google searches. He also read a Cellbrite call history in which he saw a deleted phone call from Jen McCabe's phone to Uncle Brian A. So his testimony contradicted the cell phone experts brought in by the Commonwealth who they found reasons to explain why Jen McCabe's Haas Long to Dying Cold Google search was not conducted at 2.27 a.m. It, instead, it was conducted at, you know, after 6 a.m. Um, upon finding John O'Keefe's body in the presence of Karen Reed. This expert, the defense expert, Richard Green, is saying the opposite, that that search was done at or before 2.27 a.m. in the morning. So at this point, the jurors are just going to have to decide who do they want to believe more because the expert witness testimonies are in direct uh, opposition to each other. And bringing this train home on the last day of trial testimony, we had uh, the defense expert, Dr. Frank Sheridan, a retired forensic pathologist um, who was a chief medical examiner. He said that the arm, the cuts on John's arms are abrasions from friction injuries and they were caused before John's death. He testified that the injuries are not consistent with being struck by a motor vehicle. There was no bruising, which would normally be seen. There was no fracture. There were no sprains. He also said that the arm injury pattern doesn't seem to be consistent with an automobile collision. John had a laceration on the back of his head where the impact was and had a fracture that traveled to the front of the skull. The brain had a surface bleed and a hemorrhage inside the brain. Because of the injuries, the brain swelled, which pushed against the skull. And with nowhere to go, the brain herniated towards the brain stem. He would have been unconscious from the time of the initial impact. He would have still been breathing, but unable to move around, communicate. He said the injuries are not consistent with falling on the grass or the snow. The absence of arm or any body bruising is telling, he said. He said there were no injuries to the torso, to the chest, to the abdomen, to the hips, no injury to legs. All of that is inconsistent with being in an auto accident. This man has done 13,000 autopsies during his career. About a dozen autopsies uh, he's done in which decedents were attacked or killed by feral dogs. His initial impression when he saw the photos of John's injuries were that it looked like an animal had attacked him, like a dog using his paws, using its paws and possibly um, bite marks as well. All of the marks, he said, were consistent with animal scratch marks. He's done many blunt force trauma autopsies and 
opined that John's injuries could have been consistent with a physical altercation. There were uh, bruises to the back of his hand, which he called them defensive bruises, scratches on his face, scratches on his eyelid. On cross, the witness said that the arm scratches, quote, don't remotely look, close quote, consistent with a taillight or a drinking glass or metal found on a car. He reiterated that the head injuries are not consistent with a fall to frozen ground, to asphalt, or to pavement. But if John O'Keefe was hit by an automobile and projected and his head struck the ground, it would have been enough force to cause the head injuries. But the witness insisted that for the many reasons he already stated, he didn't believe that that was the case. He said it was inconceivable for the scratches on his face to have been caused by taillight pieces. So that was a very effective and strong witness for the defense, in my opinion. The next witness was Dr. Daniel Wolf, an accident reconstructionist. After establishing that this witness is 100% neutral and that his analysis, testing, and conclusions were all done not by the defense, they were actually done and asked, requested for, um, requested by the federal government. Um, the witness established that at the time of even looking at this data, he didn't know about the Karen Reed case. We heard his opinions about the incident that occurred in early 2022. His focus during the reconstruction analysis was on the damage to the vehicle. He came up with a theory that the drinking glass was thrown at the SUV right rear taillight. He testified that based on the level of damage to the taillight, it was not caused by John O'Keefe's head. He said there's no way that John O'Keefe would be projected any distance from the SUV only by getting his arm hit by the SUV. He testified that damn it, the damage to the taillight was not consistent with striking a human head or a human arm. And this is based on the extensive testing that he did um, and relying on physics and mathematics and all of those uh, equations and very, very evidence-based and science-based, very much unlike um, the Commonwealth accident reconstructionist who did none of those uh, tests and did none of those tests. This witness admitted that while shoes can come off in a pedestrian impact in a side swipe situation, like where only an arm is impacted, like the Commonwealth's theory of the case, a shoe would not typically come off. He testified that he looked at the Lexus black box and found no incidents of note within it. But he also said there wouldn't be anything triggered in a pedestrian accident because a human isn't really heavy enough to set off a, a trigger. Those are really intended for, um, for heavy impacts. The next witness was Dr. Andrew Rentschler. He's also an accident reconstructionist who focuses his work on the human body. He found that the injuries to John's head were not consistent with being struck by an automobile at 24 miles per hour. Also, and this is based on the multiple tests that he ran, either a head or arm, which both weigh the same amount, hitting a tail light at 24 miles per hour would have caused much greater damage to it than what was found in this case. He said if a vehicle hit an arm at 24 miles per hour, he would expect to see bruising but here the abrasions seem to all to be all the same force and consistency, and there was no bruising. He testified that if an outstretched arm is hit by a car, you would see injuries to that side of the body. And then after being projected, the impacted side, which would be the opposite side, would also have injuries from that impact. John had no such injuries to his lower body at all. 
And the testimony ended with that. The defense wrapped up its case in chief and suddenly, all, all of a sudden, like that, uh, the Commonwealth, we learned, had no case rebuttal. So the jury is going to get the case. Um, the next day will be, we'll hear closing arguments the following day. And then the jury will finally get to deliberate this case. All the facts that they've heard over the 60 something witnesses um, in 30, 31 days of trial testimony. So I'm utterly exhausted. This was a long case. I don't think it needed to be as long as it did, but we needed to learn about, um, you know, the Canton basketball games and what teams they were playing early on in the case, in the Commonwealth's case, for some reason. We needed to learn, you know, who all went to the basketball games for some reason. I don't know. We needed to hear from every single witness what the weather conditions were like. Um, and we needed to hear that cumulatively. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known. I'm saying this in sarcasm. I'm saying this in jest, just in case you're not able to pick that up. So um, I will come back to you with uh, the final recap after the closing statements in the case. And then, I don't know, maybe one last recap after the verdict is being read. So until the next shot, thanks for tuning in. <laughs>